I'm Brad Half. I'm pastor of community and spiritual formation, which means I get to work with community groups and other opportunities for sp- spiritual formation here at Hope. And I'm glad to be able to have the opportunity to teach today. I believe that Sunday morning and what we do here together is a great opportunity for spiritual growth because we enter into God's word and try to understand what it's saying and its application for our life. So with that in mind, I want to encourage you to take some notes today. Not, nothing special about today. I would encourage you to do this every week uh, as a way to kind of remember what's going on here. I think uh, hopefully you've got a worship guide, and if you've got a pen, you can take notes. If uh, You could borrow one from somebody. There's space in here to do that. Or, um, but the opportunity that we have is to write some stuff down that God might be wanting us to remember. And it's an opportunity to also then come back to that a little bit later. Most of our community groups uh, study what the sermon is going, uh, doing on Sunday. For instance, I'm in a group that meets on Sunday nights, and we look at what the sermon is about, and we talk about it, and we, we write down our own questions and challenges, and then we get to talk about those things together. We've run into a little bit of problem the last couple Sunday nights because of the football playoffs. So uh, last week we got creative and decided we were going to use halftime for, uh, you know, kind of do all the warm up, eat some food. Then we opened our Bibles at halftime and had a discussion about the sermon series. It went into the third quarter. By the time we turned the game on, New England had scored two more times and the game was kind of over. But we enjoyed a good time together that night. So small group, community group is a great place to discuss this stuff together. You could also take some notes and share them with uh, your kids or uh, your spouse and talk about this on the way home. Maybe you want to bring it back out later in your week and reflect on it a little bit then. But again, if you write it down, you've got the opportunity to reflect on it a little bit more. And studies have shown time and time again that we remember more of what we write down and we remember more, even more of what we discuss with other people. So if you'd like to be in a group that you could discuss the sermon with other folks, then we'd invite you to come to group link to join a small group. That'll be in a couple weeks from today. So, uh, yeah, uh, as you think about writing something down, today I actually want to ask you to write a word down that, that uh, is something that in your life, you can be as general or specific as you want, it's for your benefit, um, although I might ask some of you to call these out in a little bit. Um, the, write down a word uh, that represents kind of an area of life that causes you anxiety or worry or stress. Okay, we've all got these parts of life that kind of make us anxious. And the, the scripture we're going to turn to in a little bit, Jesus is addressing this, some of the things that cause us to worry. And he's got some instruction for us about it. So I want to think about, before we go into the scripture, what are those areas that cause you worry? So think about that. Write it down. I know for my house this week, uh, my kids had exams. So some of you students probably had exams, right? Um, probably most of you. And uh, I came home one afternoon and I asked my younger son, Ethan, I said, where's your older brother? Where's Matthew? He said, I don't know, dad, but you probably don't want to talk to him because he's in a t- bad mood. He's totally stressed because of his exams. And I was like, okay, I'll give Matthew a little bit of space. Uh, I know what that's like. We all can feel stress about different things. So uh, what are some of the things, students, probably exams, uh, probably relationships, what are some other things that um, cause stress in our lives? Work. Money, did somebody say, I think I heard money and then I heard work. Okay, money, our finances, managing it, paying our bills, not spending more than we have can be you know, challenging. Um, not sure that we have enough resources to kind of pay the bills at the end of month, that can be tough. Um, and using our money well is, is, is tough to do sometimes. Work can be stressful because we may feel like there's more work than we can get done. We may be concerned or anxious about how we're performing in our job. Like, are we, are we up to par? Have we met the goals that we're supposed to have? How are we going to be evaluated on our work? That can be stressful. Uh, what, is, what are one or two other things? Health. health? Uh, yeah, health. And... Wanting to take care of our bodies, but knowing that the, no matter what we do or don't do, sometimes things can still go wrong, and uh, that can be challenging, right, to say the least. And um, we're, we're not always in control on what happens in our bodies, for sure. What are, uh, one more thing. Family issues. 
family uh, relationships. Somebody last night said, um, they said children are stressful, and I would agree with that. Uh, because I think from the moment you have children, you start to worry about them. I think from the moment that actually they're conceived, you start to worry about them. Like, are they developing in the womb okay? And is everything going all right? You're listening to the heartbeat. You're starting to be concerned about your kids. And as my kids have gotten older, it's now my concern is, are they making good decisions? Uh, they're kind of going out of our house more, and I don't see what's happening. Are they going to be wise and smart? And so I worry about them. Are they going to be safe? You know, uh, that's tough to do. But somebody also, some, some, last night somebody said children, and then a kid said parents can be stressful. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's fair enough, right? That parents who are trying their best to do what's right, but they might have some rules that you don't understand, or they might, they might uh, be causing you some, some worry in your life. So uh, one of the common things about things that we worry about is a little bit of the unknown and fear of the unknown, that something about this bad thing could go wrong down the road. Certainly that with our health or with our job or, you know, we, just a lot of things that we're not in control of. And so the possibility to hear that something might go wrong. And when we begin to get stressed about something and we're kind of thinking about it and worrying about it, it actually changes our bodies physiologically. We actually start to increase our heart rate, rate adrenaline starts going through our body. We're, we kind of get in a heightened state of, of kind of wanting to respond. And this is, is, is the way we're wired. The, they've called this the fight or flight response to stress. So, and the idea here is that you encounter something that's, you know, could be harmful and you either need to fight it or you need to run from it. So you, you gotta be prepared to protect yourself. But the problem is most of the stressful things that we encounter in everyday life here are not things that we need to fight or run from. They're things that we need to work through and, and try to figure out and, and, and be wise about and, and kind of figure out how to handle. So we're gonna talk some today about what it might mean to trust God with some of those things that we often worry about. What it might mean to invite God into some of those areas of life that maybe seem pretty mundane but are still important and significant. As we continue into the Lord's Prayer, today's verse is give us today our daily bread. And this represents a transition from where we've been. Obviously, we've been talking about what it means to, as we pray, to, to listen to God and to be still at times. Um, and in the first part of the Lord's Prayer, it was a huge emphasis on worshiping God, or that his name would be hallowed, that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done. So this was a very God-focused prayer as we begin this. The transition that we're moving to now is that it's not a self-focused prayer, but it is bringing our needs to God that we're going to talk about daily bread. And then in subsequent weeks, we'll be talking about uh, forgive us our debts and then lead us not into temptation. So these are the parts of the prayer that begin to be the petitions, things that we're asking God to do. So that's the transition. You can read, uh, the words are gonna be up on the screen. I'm gonna read a little bit before the Lord's Prayer and then a few verses later in Matthew chapter six that are, are toward the end of the chapter that have to do with uh, prayer and worry as well. So uh, listen as I read or read along. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then further down in verse 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
as we, uh, as we think and move into this text today, and as I spent some time in, in it this week preparing, I really tried to say, okay, what is this really saying? What, how would I summarize some of what the teaching is here about prayer, uh, what the invitation is? So I, I came up with kind of a thesis statement that has helped and really is, will be an outline for today that we'll walk through together. So this is what I, I believe this scripture is teaching, that prayer is talking with God about everyday things and depending on him to give us what we need so that we will be changed for his glory. I'm gonna walk us through this kind of step by step or, or line by line of this. So prayer is talking with God. We've already spoken in the previous weeks and David encouraged us to spend some time in quiet with God without asking for anything. So definitely prayer is about listening, that's for sure. But prayer is also about talking. And uh, that's pretty clear in this passage because Jesus gives them these words. Uh, in these words, the question here is really, who are you talking to? Jesus gives an example of one person. He call, the, the, the word is the hypocrites, but really uh, it means actors, those who are just kind of playing a role. For those people, they're speaking out loud and their audience is really the other people in the, in the synagogue or on the street corner who would hear them. That's who their audience is. That's who they're talking to. or That's what, who they want to be heard by. Uh, sometimes we can feel like we're just kind of maybe talking to ourselves is kind of what it can feel like. But what the scripture says here is that if we go into a private place, that we can know that our Father who is unseen hears us, and it also says that he even knows what we need. So our audience is our Father in heaven. I think we get the Father part. I think we, we know, most of us, what it is to have a Father. But sometimes we don't get the... Um, we don't get this, the idea that our Father who art in heaven. We hear heaven and we think a faraway place and a future. Uh, it's kind of a then and there kind of idea. Where that's not the way a Jewish listener or the person who Jesus was telling to pray this way, they would have heard this differently because their understanding that was there was the earth and there were the heavens and, and the heaven and earth met and that the heavens were all around us. They, they, they were right here. In fact, one of my seminary professors used to translate this and say, our Father who is as close as the air that we breathe. That, that this, the idea of heaven is here and now, that it's a, it's a present reality. It's not just a future place or a future time, but it's a God that we're praying to is as close as the, the air that we breathe. I think because we don't understand this, some of our prayers are, can be misguided in that a common, common prayer, I think that I find myself praying it, and I've heard other people pray it, is, God, will you be with me in this situation? God, will you be with these people as they enter into this tough thing? When what we've got to know here is that God is with us already. He knows and sees. He's unseen, but he sees us, and he is with us. And uh, so really the reality here is we're reminding ourselves about an unseen God who is present to us at all times. Sometimes we, I think, kind of do our own thing and kind of forget about God, but it's not that he's with us, it's just that we're, not, in one sense, not really with him. So our prayer, rather than asking God, will you be with me, I think we need to change that and say, God, will you help me to remember that you are with me? And, and that's, that's really what the truth is here. One of my, uh, a professor that I had for several courses in spiritual formation was a man named Dallas Willard. And Dallas would often talk about the idea of having a, a developing a conversational relationship with God. And by this, he would say, conversation is really how we know anybody. This is how intimacy develops. If you think about somebody that you maybe were dating, a first date and getting to know them, if you, if you just go to the movies and look at the movie, you really don't learn anything about each other. But if you sit across the table and you start talking to each other and have a conversation, you know more of their heart, they get a glimpse of your heart. There's a knowing, there's an intimacy that develops in a conversation. So that what we're invited to in praying to the God who is unseen is to begin to develop a conversation where we share with God what's on our heart, where we listen and receive from him during that time of prayer as well. Uh, I had an experience with a spiritual director, which is basically somebody who listens to people and tries to help guide them and 
reflect on what God's doing in somebody's life. And I've done this several points in life. And I was sitting with the spiritual director one time and they started our time together by saying to me, tell me what is on your heart. Uh, and when I heard them say that, I made a connection that I knew that that question was coming from this person, but I knew it was also coming from God himself. That God wants, wants at that point and still wants to know what is on my heart. He wants to know the things that I'm excited about and looking forward to. He wants to know the things that I'm anxious about and fearful. He wants to know the things that are waking me up at night. He wants to know everything about it. And he, he's inviting us to have a conversational relationship with him where we talk about those things as we go about our life and as we really go about our everyday things. So that's the next part of this, this outline. The prayer is about talking with God about every, everyday things. I've mentioned a bunch of these already, the things that are, are pretty common. But the church hadn't always understood the, the Lord's Prayer and our daily bread in this way. In some sense, the church used to understand it. With the, the church fathers, Tertullian and Augustine, used to say this is about spiritual food. This is about uh, God himself, Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. So when we're asking for our daily bread, they said this is a spiritual sense. Because they said, okay, this prayer has been a beautiful, grand prayer about our Father in heaven and hallowed be his name. And it's about his kingdom and his purposes and, and his will. We can't now make this about something as mundane and everyday as our, what we're going to eat today. Really, that's what we're going to pray to the God of the universe about, what, what we're going to eat. Uh, and, and so they, they kind of dismissed this, that it was about that. Now, I don't think it, it is just about praying for what we're going to get in our food today, but I also think that it, it's, it is about that. And in fact, the, the reformers in the history of the church began to correct this understanding. And Luther said um, that it, it really changed the way people understand this. He said, bread is a symbol for everything necessary for the preservation of this life like food, a healthy body, good weather, house, home, wife, children, good government, and peace. I think we could add that to like finances and work and school and relationships and uh, because God is concerned about the things that are on our hearts. He wants to know those things and he wants us to pray about those things to him. And that's what this idea of, of praying, give us today our daily bread, is saying, God, give me what I need for this day. I know that sometimes we can make this about what we want, and I think it's good to express our desires for God, but we can know that he's going to respond with what we need. Dale Bruner, uh, a commentator, said that if we understand this idea of going into our closet and praying, that we would think about this a little bit differently in regard to our daily bread. He said that the, the closet it's, that's spoken of here, some translators uh, translated this as the storeroom or the shed, go into your shed. Now, again, now we have a different, little bit different understanding, right? This would have been the room where the tools were kept. Bruner said, this is the, probably the one room in your house that didn't have any windows. It's probably the one room in your house that had a lock on it because this is where you kept your valuables. This is how the tools that you use to earn your living as a farmer or a carpenter or whatever you did, that's where those, your tool shed was where those things would have been kept. So the idea here is that Jesus is telling them, don't pray in the streets, but instead go into your, your work shed and pray and ask me for, for these things. And so can you imagine what it would have been like to be praying to God for your daily bread and you're surrounded by the tools that you actually use to earn your living and to, to provide for your family. This is how your daily, you get your daily bread. And the sense of partnership, that this is, this is not just kind of my work that I do, but every good gift that we have is from God. He gives us the ability to do the work that, that we have before us. He gives us the, uh, the vision and the passion for work as well. So, Dale Bruner is suggesting that in this, this everyday thing is if, if we were praying in that tool shed, we would be praying to God about the work that we're doing and the work that was before us. And what's encouraging to me about that is the invitation here is then to pray about the way that we spend the majority of our week 
I mean, I guess we spend a lot of time sleeping, but then we spend a lot of time at work, right? So we have the opportunity here to pray about this every day, what maybe seems mundane, um, it, you know, a grind, it might feel like it's, it's a tough, tough thing, but we're invited to pray and talk to God about the very work that we're doing. I know, um, I know of a school teacher, I've known school teachers, who would, in their classroom, would pray in the morning before school and would sit in the chairs that their kids would be sitting in and would pray for God's work. They knew things about their families. They knew things about these kids and how they struggled, and they were praying for God to work. You see there, again, the sense of partnership, but the, the, a teacher who prays that knows that, that they want God to show up. They want this to be the work that they're doing with, in teaching kids. They want it to be a partnership with what God is doing. I've known of doctors who've prayed with patients, and if patients were open to that and would pray with them before a surgery or just at a regular visit, and uh, would, would pray, or, or nurses, who, who again are inviting God to say, I'm gonna care for this person, but God, we know we want you, we ask you to care for this person. We ask you to bring healing. We ask you to use um, this, the work that I'm doing to care for these people as well. So we could go on and on with this, but my question for you is, what would it mean for you to pray to God uh, about your daily work? What would it look like for you to do that? Would you pray in the car maybe on the, on the way to work? That might make a lot of sense as you're preparing and thinking about your day ahead. Would you pray between some meetings when you know, okay, we've got a big decision coming up? Would you pray before a presentation? You probably would there. Uh, but this, this opportunity to say, what would it look like for you to partner with God and invite him into the work that you're doing and pray about, the, about everyday things like work? And when we do that, when we pray, we are really uh, depending on God to give us what we need. And this brings me to the third line here, the third point of this, that this is a, this is a, a prayer is by its nature an act of dependence to say, this is what I'm asking. I'm asking you to provide. I'm asking you to give me what I need. And that's what the prayer for daily bread was. It wasn't a prayer for weekly bread or monthly bread or yearly bread. It was a prayer for daily bread. It was a prayer for what we needed for that day. To me, it reminds me of uh, the wilderness when God the, it provided manna for the Israelites, that he was providing for them what they needed for that day, the food that they needed. And when they tried to store some up and take some extra for the, for the next day, because they were feeling a little greedy, it, it spoiled. And what God was trying to teach them is that he was going to provide for them each day, that he was going to give them what they needed. They didn't need to worry about tomorrow, and Jesus says that here in this text as well, but ask God to provide what you need for today. Most of us, I don't think, like this idea in one sense of daily dependence, because one, I think we would rather just be independent. From, from the beginning of life, as we grow uh, from, as little kids, we start wanting to do things by ourselves. We start wanting, and appropriately, we start saying we're gonna feed ourselves or dress ourselves, bathe ourselves. That's what independence really looks like in pretty much every area of life is that as we mature, we become more and more able to do things on our own, more independent. Uh, I think about this with my, I've got three boys, my wife and I have three sons, and as they grow, we're always trying to help them kind of figure out how to do things on their own because that's part of our job as a parent to help them become independent. So this, this week, uh, one of our sons was, we were teaching him to do laundry, right? He's gotta know that. He's, he's not off at college yet, but he will be one day. So uh, it, as he was learning to do his laundry this week, he put a blue sweatshirt in with a bunch of white clothes. You, we, most of us know the result. So he had uh, blue tinted uh, undershirts. Uh, that's what happens when you're learning to do things on your own. You make some mistakes, but you learn that way. We're also teaching our kids how to drive. Uh, he got his license this year. Um, my other son's off at college and, and you know, he's learning some independence there. We're teaching him how to drive. We're teaching him also then how to take care of the car and what it needs to be repaired and what that means, which in our household means you call AAA. So if, if your car needs to be repaired, we're, we're not really good at taking care of cars. But I actually had my son, before he went back to college, the battery was dead on the car, and I said, okay, here, 
here's the AAA card, here's how you call, they're gonna come, you meet them, I'll be here if you need me, let me know. I wanted him to know how to do this so that when he's stranded on the side of the road, he's like, okay, I can call AAA, I've done that before, it's not a foreign idea. I want my son to, sons to learn to be independent. And that's what maturity looks like. However, in life with God, maturity does not look like independence. It looks like dependence. This is the one area of life that as we grow older and wiser, what God wants for us is to trust him more and more, to, to give him more parts of our life where we say, God, I don't, I don't wanna do this on my own, I wanna do this with you. I wanna talk to you, God, about this part of life, about every part of life. And I wanna receive all that you wanna give me to know how to live and to be a wise person and to be a good person. Uh, so we begin to have this opportunity to invite God to do those things day by day, moment by moment. Uh, I heard a neat example this week of a friend posted something on Facebook. He's here, part of this church. He said, uh, my son woke up with a bad dream and he said, and he came to me and asked that I, if I could pray with him. He said, and then he wrote, glad to see that my son's first response was to, to pray. And uh, that's so beautiful on multiple levels. One, because this child was going to his father and saying, can we pray to our heavenly father because I'm scared. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, if we could all learn that, right? If we could all learn and pay attention to the things going inside of us when we start to feel anxious, when we start to feel stressed and let that be a signal that we need to go to our Father and pray. Uh, I think our lives would look very different. And if we do that, then I think what will happen is this, uh, this fourth point, and th is that we will be changed for God's glory. That we will be changed for God's glory. I, I used to think prayer was primarily about uh, getting what I want, wanted from God, getting God to give me things. And I used to often think that prayer was about changing God's mind. And there are places in scripture that talk about God changing his mind and the persistence of prayers doing that. But what I've learned over the years is that prayer is really about me changing myself. And I think we get glimpses of this in this text, right? We get glimpses that it's not my will, but your will. It's not about my kingdom, but it's about your kingdom coming, God. It's about, not about me seeking what I want first, but about seeking first your kingdom. See, those are the prayers of people that want to change, if you're gonna pray those kinds of things. And I think that happens. So when we pray thy kingdom come, I think we remember and realize that his kingdom is coming in us and through us. And when we pray thy will be done, we're aligning ourselves with his purposes. And it changes the way we think. And we, when we seek first his kingdom, our priorities change, and what's important to us changes. C.S. Lewis has a great quote that I'll share with you about prayer. He says, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. It changes me. I've had experience with this time and time again in my own life. One of them that I was reflecting on this week was about a year ago when I, uh, there was a big decision that our, our family was, was trying to think through. And I felt like the majority of the family was saying, this is what we wanna do and this is, this is what, what we should do. And I really didn't agree with that decision. I thought it was wrong and I, I just didn't like it. Um, so I was like, God, do you want me to go with this or should I just kind of remove myself and, and kind of do my own thing here? And in this discussion, it reminded me a little bit of, I was like, God, are those my options? That like, I, I fight to get them to do what I want or I flee? Back to that again, the fight or flight. Are those my options, God? Which, which of those options do you want me to do? And what I heard pretty clearly, not in an audible voice, but in the Spirit's leading was, no, uh, there's another way, there's another option here, that you could learn to trust me even when something isn't going the way you think it should go, and you don't have to bail out of something just because um, you're afraid that it's not gonna go well. So what would it mean to trust God in the middle of this decision? So uh, it, it didn't go the way I wanted, 
and, uh, but, but God worked it for good, and good things happened, and I had some influence on, on some of that. I was a part of that in a way that I would not have been if I had just chosen to bail. And that taught me that as I sought God in prayer to say, do you want me to choose A or B, God was really saying, no, I want you to choose C. There's another option here, and this is a better one. And, but this one is going to require that you trust me. And that changed who I was. And this is what we have the opportunity to do. To trust God with everyday parts of our lives. Uh, to invite him in to speak to those things and give us what we need. I want to conclude here by just noticing with you something that's also in this text. When Jesus uh, is talking to the or, or talking about the people who pray on the, in the synagogues on the street corners, he says to them that they have received their reward in full. So if they were praying in those places, in essence, they were praying to get noticed. And Jesus said, in essence, they've gotten noticed. They, they got their reward. They've received it. But he says, to those of you who would choose to pray to me in private, to a God who is unseen, I will see your prayers, and I myself will reward you. Um, so you get this kind of reward of this life, which is recognition and being seen by others, or we could get this other reward that is from God. Now, the text doesn't say this, but I believe this other reward is that we actually get an intimate relationship with God himself, that he himself and his presence with us is a reward. When we go to a private place and seek him in prayer and invite him into those parts of our life where we need uh, him to provide, where we need him to give us wisdom, where we need him to change us. When we invite him in, we get fellowship with him, we get intimacy with him, which is the thing that we want most of all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a God who is near to us, that you're not far away, that you're not distant. You see our situation, you know us. And you long for us to come to you and tell us what is on our hearts. So we, Lord, in this day, want to do that. We want to give to you the things that are making us anxious and fearful. We want to give to you the things that feel like uncertainties and unknowns. And we invite you to give us what we need. And we invite you to change us and to meet us in this place. And we pray all of this would be for your glory, amen.